Well, hello, everyone. This is Al Fadi, and I'm so excited uh, to uh, uh, share with you today a very special edition of our show, Let Us Reason. You can see uh, right off the bat uh, with me here two amazing uh, servants of the Lord and uh, those that I, I feel proud to call a sister in Christ and a brother in Christ, uh, Sister Hatoon and uh, our dear brother, Dr. J. Smith. Welcome to both of you. Hello. Hello, Hatun. Peace. Can you hear us? I can hear you. Yeah, it's fine. Very good. Peace of so, uh, with you. Uh, sorry, sorry. I am hearing echo from one of you. Okay. Uh, if uh, if you're not talking, uh, uh, you can go ahead basically and mute just to be in the safe side um, because I know technology is going to be a little bit of problematic today. So um, today's topic, as we announced it, uh, and I'm speaking to everyone here who's watching, has to do with the dilemma of the Quranic preservation. And if you are someone who is passionate about Islamic apologetics or knowing anything about reaching Muslims and specifically the topics that, you know, Hatun has been dealing with in the last few years, which is the different Qurans, if you wish, or let's say Qur'at, if you wish, and then uh, Dr. J. Smith as well, dealing with a lot of uh, not only Quranic criticism, but also historical criticism. And my passion uh, in terms of studying one of the earliest Quranic manuscripts, not to mention my background as a, an Arab uh, who grew up a Muslim in the heartland of Islam in Saudi Arabia. And today I am a follower of Christ. So recently, in the last couple of weeks, there were two prominent Islamic scholars, uh, you know, and I'm talking to Jay and Hatun, um, Dr. Shabir Ali and also Dr. Yasser Qadir. And both of them made some amazing admissions when it came to the different, um, uh, I should say, uh, readings, but also the problems of the early history of the Quran. And with that said, because before we even engage into this, I really want to um, honor Sister Hatun for being one, uh, the one who pioneered this whole topic up in the open by going to Speaker's Corner, doing a couple of shows with Jay, bringing in different Qurans. And uh, I am the proud recipient of a couple of copies already uh, from that amazing collection that she had. But with that says, I really want to ask you, uh, Hatun, what got you into the topic of the different Qurans or different Qurats? What, what, what prompted you to be interested in that particular area? And how did you go about finding these various copies? Okay. So, um, peace of Christ be with you, brother. Just a technical issue. Right now, I'm hearing you from my... I'm hearing you from my computer as well as I am hearing from YouTube. So one of you is one of you. So has you, you may want to you may want to mute one of them, Hatun, because that's what's going to happen if you want to mute one at least because you okay, won't be I able. Don't, I don't have YouTube on. Okay, got it. I thought maybe you have it on. All right. Well, let's just keep going. Uh, I don't know if anyone is having YouTube open right now. I don't know, Jay. Uh, no. Okay. On, on, sorry. Okay. Keep going, uh, Hatun. We'll we'll deal with it. Yeah. Do you still hear it, Hatun? Okay, I think. It... I don't hear it here. I, I don't. Okay, sure I think it's gone now. Okay, sorry about that. I think it's gone. So I was hearing like what we are speaking, and also I was hearing that from. Oh no, it's still on. It's still on. So what? What I hear YouTube from one of you, but anyway. Um, I think the question was how I did got involved with different Arabic Qurans. Um, uh, I think the question was how I did got involved with different Arabic Qurans. Um, the way I got involved uh, is actually was by accident. Um, I grew up with learning that there is only one perfect Quran and wherever you go around the world, uh, the Quran is exactly the same. And when I met with Jay Smith at Speaker's Corner, I hear same arguments from Muslims. And it was a miracle. I end up in North Africa. And by accident, when we were buying Quran from the bookshop, a uh, guy who was selling the book simply said, uh, 
which Quran do you want? Do you want wash Quran or normal Quran? I never heard by that time. I just like, I'll get the wash Quran, whatever is that. It was less than a pound. So I got wash Quran and I brought that to England. Um, start going through it and noticed actually uh, name is different. There are textual variations in it. I think that was the first time I come across with um, different Arabic Qurans. And since that was approximately 2015, probably. And today we've got 37 different Arabic Qurans. And one of the amazing thing is now um, in 2015, uh, even before 2015, the argument was there is only one perfect Quran, all the same. Until last week, still Muslims were making the same claim. Now we get to hear from Muslim scholars, yep, there are the different Qurans. You know, Jay, uh, you also uh, got involved in this, of course, and um, between you and Hatun, you guys have done a number of YouTube videos, but but also tell me about your encounter with this issue at the speaker's corner. I mean, I remember the first time both of you went to the speaker's corner and you brought these different Qurans with you. I, I remember it wasn't really well received. If you can just maybe reminisce on what happened. Yeah, I think once it, this was not something that I was really interested in at the time and Hutton really perked my interest because she was the one that was really finding these different Qurans. And of course she was, having other people buy them up at different other other countries. And it was at that time that she came to me about it. And I said, well, listen, she and I decided, why don't we just introduce this at the corner? When we did this in 2016, uh, the first time we did it, there was an uproar. And you can see, you can go up and look in the video uh, on Fender Films. Uh, I think it's just skyrocketed because I put it up again a second time last week or about two weeks ago. Look at the, look who's in the crowd. And look who's actually pulling away the people, the Muslims who are there. It's Muhammad Hijab. Muhammad Hijab was in the audience. Uh, he was demanding that all the Muslims leave. Now, he looks a lot thinner there in the video because that was four years ago. This is the same Muhammad Hijab who this last Monday, just a five days ago, had this interview with Yasser Qadi about this very problem. And you could see he's pleading with them right through the video to actually answer this problem, which was a, a, a created a crisis for Yasser Qadi there in uh, Yale 25 years ago. So it's obvious to me that what Hatun has been doing and what she has been discovering, uh, the fact that we took it and made it public, made it so public, because by 2016, there were cameras. So we had smartphones and we could immediately upload this right up into the Internet. The very next day, Hatun and I, after we first introduced it, because there's there's chaos at the corner. Uh, it's an enormous amount of noise, uh, gesticulation. You can see they tried to grab uh, the the papers from our hands. They they uh, were jostling our, our cameraman. They were upset. They were angry. When we did it a second time, uh, a little later, a few months later, they almost didn't let us leave the corner. They were trying to grab those Qurans from our bags. They were so upset with us. So what, yeah, what um, uh, Hattun and I did is we went and did a studio copy. And that's also up on Fender Films. You can see it. I don't know if it's on DCCI as well. But we did a studio copy, take in a very, uh, well, it's in a like environment we're in right now, going in a library where we could just look at each one of these and hold them up and then doing some comparisons between the different texts. So in that context, that's where we were able to then explain what we were trying to explain at the latter, but we're not permitted to because of all the noise, the yelling, the, uh, the anger, and also... The, the, need, the need to get the Muslims out of there. So this has been going on for four years, and I think this is why we need to give an awful lot of, uh, uh, we need to get an awful lot of thanks to Hatun. I think had not Hatun found this, had she not gone and found this one uh, water, which we, most of us know about this. This is nothing new, the, the, what she's coming up with. It is well known. I remember he uh, hearing about this when I was taking my Islamic courses back in the 1980s. So this is not new material. It's just that nobody has actually gone to look at that. No one's actually gone to go public with this. This is something that we need to bring up somewhere in this broadcast. What is happening in academia and what is happening on the ground? What are the academics who know this very well? And this is why Qadi had such a problem when he went to Yale. And what is actually happening up on the internet? What's happening up on YouTube? Because we have two different worlds. They're talking past each other and they're not talking to each other. And they're, the, the popular world, the one that's in YouTube is making one claim, whereas the academic world, which is isolated from that popular world, is making a completely different claim. 
Yeah, so just to let you guys know that I just received word that Hijab deleted about 30 minutes of his talk with uh, Yasser Qadi. Uh, that probably covers the portions that uh, Yasser Qadi was struggling with. And uh, thankfully, of course, all of this has been downloaded anyway, so you can delete it all you want. This is kind of like a thematic approach by our Muslim friends. There is always, whenever there is a competition or problem, you burn it, you sink it, or you delete it any way you want to call it. Uh, before so, he was able to download it, have you seen how many people have watched that video on his site? Now remember the video. Absolutely. Interview. Have you seen the comments by Muslims who are irritated by both of them? Listen, it's, a, it's an hour and 45 minute video. You need to watch the whole hour and 45 minutes. This part on the Quran is only 25 minutes of it. I'm sure, I can't say, I'm not sure that that's the one he's deleted. But if, the, if you look at the whole hour and 45 minutes, look at the the tussle between hijab and Qadi. And you're talking, you're seeing two worlds who are conflicting at, at each other. And this is exciting because for the first time, we're seeing a, a, a conversation between these two worlds. And we're, this is a conversation that has not yet got into the internet. And what a gift to have this right there on the internet so that we can look at it and say, listen, we don't have, we've already crossed these problems in Christianity. Why haven't the Muslims had this conversation 1400 years ago? This should have been a conversation 1400 years ago or i would say not 1400 years probably only 1200 years ago yeah hold your thought i mean i like where you're going with this and and uh, uh I, by the way folks i just want to tell you uh, some of you probably are uh you know christians they're you know, aware of the textual criticism of the bible you might be asking uh, us so what's the big deal so what that there is textual criticism in the quran so what well because of what jay just mentioned uh the fact that the Western actually academia, uh, and I'm, I know Jay was mentioned, we'll talk about this, is caught up to the Quran also and its manuscript and now beginning to see that there are some issues with the Quran. Now, academically speaking, maybe there is no problem whatsoever if it is accepted, but the Islamic community, and I can tell you as one of those who followed Islam, to tell me that there is different Qurans, it's a taboo. It's a blasphemy against the word of God. Why? Because the Quran itself testifies in chapter 85, verse 22, and chapter 15, verse 9, that it's preserved in the preserved tablets in heaven, that Allah himself have preserved it, have protected it from, from what? From corruption. To come to me and tell me there are different Qurans, that's why, you know, what we're going to talk about today is kind of interesting because these scholars now, like Shabir Ali in particular, are using Christian lingo to try to wrestle with these differences. Before I get there, Hatun, once again, so what got you into finding additional copies? Now, we know you got Warsh. Great. So how did you start to go and seek uh, other copies, for instance, like Cologne and, uh, you know, uh, the others as well, especially if we want to look at the 10 Qur'at and the 14 Qur'at in particular? You have more than that, of course. Um, I just wanted to express that... Um uh, sound is being fixed because it was coming from Dr. J. Smith. <laughs> uh, so now I can hear what you are saying on the time. Um, before I answer that question, we love okay. Jay. I just want to make it clear. <laughs> Lord Jesus loves him, and He gave Himself for him. Um, before we, uh, before I answer that question, I wanted to point out something. So, in the time of Uthman, well, sorry, in the time of Muhammad. Uh, soon after he dies, Muslim notice, okay, there are some creepy verses in the Quran. How they can handle that? Sheep comes and then eats those verses. In the time of Uthman, uh, there are different Qurans. Uthman orders everything to be burned. In uh, time of uh, Al-Hajjaj, he destroys all the Qurans. 1924, Qurans goes under the river. Nine, uh, 2020, Muslims express something that they should not express publicly what is one of the way to fix it you just take out the last 30 minutes of the video so that you pretend it never happened a very very islamic way to approach things the only um, difference hatun <laughs> the only difference hatun in our day we have different platforms and ways to save and yeah. preserve so it's still yeah. out there yeah yeah and so I got um, I got Wash Quran and then we start like comparing them and we we had a lovely Arabic sister she start like yeah pointing out yeah that's different that's different and what I've done after that I as I was kind of traveling different part of the world I was just like start stopping on the shops and then ask them if they had any different any Qurans I was I would ask like which they had and then 
buy all the different Qurans. Sometimes I had like same couple of same Qurans. Sometimes um, they were different. And once I figured out, yeah, you can get hold on different Arabic Qurans very easily as soon as you go to the creepy shops in Middle East or in North Africa. Uh, I send message out uh, to some of my brothers and sisters in Middle East and North Africa. And then I said, if anyone come across with any something called Krats of the Quran, just let me know. From that, um, some Qurans kind of came with the brothers who live in that part of the world. They just find creeping uh, different Qurans and then they send them to me. Some of them I uh, traveled and then you just stopped and then I bought them. and. Um, amazing thing is that one perfect Quran turned up to be 37 different perfect Arabic Qurans. I hear you. Now, just to let everyone know, thank you, by the way, everyone, for, for being here. Uh, Islam Critique, I agree with you. Uh, he, you mentioned that deleting it from his site, speaking about hijab, wouldn't do him any good simply because everyone has it already. So uh, there is truth to that. And what I want to say also uh, is that me and Sister Hatoon, I believe in about uh, uh, probably two hours from now, give or take, we will be on her site at DCCI and we will be uh, critiquing a talk that was recently done by Dr. Shabir Ali concerning the Sana'a manuscript. Given that I have a passion for that manuscript and I'm doing my studies on it, we are going to uh, analyze his 10 minute video whether time allows us to analyze all of it or not, uh, that's yet to be seen, but we will be talking about that. Now, um, uh, Jay, I wanna uh, turn this uh, over to you. And I want you, first of all, Jay, tell us about uh, the most recent development, first by Shabir, and then we wanna talk about um, uh, Yasser Qadi, both of us, basically. Go ahead. Let me just say real quickly, uh, so people are saying that it has not been cut out. I've just gone on to uh, Muhammad Hijab's site. It is cut out, it's down to one hour and 16 minutes, so it has been cut out. I've gone on to Yasser Qadi's site. It is still there on Yasser Qadi's site. On his site, it is one hour and 45 minutes. So, you know, kudos to Yasser Qadi. He has not cut it out. Maybe he will, but Muhammad Hijab has cut out uh, probably the 25 minutes we're looking for. And I'm thankful, Jay, that you brought this about Yasser Qadi. I really admire people who are honest, at least in their yes. assessment. I mean, um, whether we agree or disagree uh, faith-wise or view-wise, at least he's honest enough to say it and state <clears> it. And uh, I don't, I don't think you should be ashamed about it because these, these are the facts that are out there. Yeah. So, it's, Jay, I'm sorry. It's not go ahead. Sorry, it's not something like he just shared it. Um, in his book, uh, Intro to um, Quranic Science, uh, he expressed that uh, there are different Arabic Qurans out there. So he's been talking about it, but because he's not as popular as speakers call a Muslim missionary, therefore it didn't get people's attention now speakers corner people involved with their like big followers now it get it got the attention of the world and yeah yeah so jay you invested a lot of time recently taking talks by shabir ali and also by yasser qadi uh, qadi and uh, you've done uh, uh, you know amazing analysis brother and uh, you and i probably will be even uh, doing more work on this so i want you to go ahead and take us through um, uh, first, Shabir Ali's assertions in general about the Quran and the work that you have done recently. Yeah, okay. I mean, I, I'm, I'm glad you're, you two are going to be doing this later on because you need to really unpack it. For those who don't know, this is actually, uh, this is the area that uh, Al-Fadi is doing his PhD on. So you are quickly becoming the world authority on the Sana'a manuscript. So kudos to you. If anybody knows what's going on with the Sana'a, you do. And I think that's why it's important that you that people listen to what happens in two hours when, when you two go and unpack that. But if you look back and see what Shabir Ali said on May 19th, so we're just talking a few weeks ago, on May 19th, he did admit, now this is not the first time he's admitted, but he did it in such a way, he said, there are differences, we've known about these differences, and that's true. This is nothing new, what he said. What he was very careful of is that he said over and over again, that these differences in these kira'at, now we're talking about 30 official kira'at, 10 uh, readers, and uh, 20 what we know as narrators, or um, what they call as transmitters. So those are, we're talking about 30 official ones that are now recognized today. Um, Hatu, you have what, 37 already in your possession? Uh yeah, I've got 37. So she's got another 70 beyond that. But anyways, he's saying, not, if you look at any one of these, 
they are all saying pretty much the same thing because they don't change any doctrine, they don't change any belief, and they don't change any practice. Those are the three things he kept on reminding us of. Now, that's, I mean, he, what he's doing, he's taking a page out of our own book. He's doing the same thing we have said about Mark chapter 16, verse uh, 9 through 20, what we said about John chapter 7, verse 53 to John chapter 8, 11, verse 11, what we said about 1 John chapter 5, 7. Those are verses that are well known, about 40 verses of the New Testament that are not found in the earliest Greek manuscripts. And we've said, listen, though we keep them in there, we leave them in there, because there's no new doctrine that they, into, that they uh, add to what we already know. So that's why we keep them in there. But we warn the readers. See, this is what the difference is. In the Bible, we warn the readers, we put a line before and after, and we say these verses are not found in the various Greek manuscripts, so that people will not suggest, well, will not therefore assume that these are part of the earliest manuscripts. That's all it is, the earliest manuscripts. Now, that's what we're willing to say, the earliest manuscripts. Have you ever seen a Muslim say that? The earliest manuscripts. Of course that's not. a whole nother, that's a whole nother kettle of fish that Gandhi has not answered, that Shabir Ali has not answered, that you and I are going to go into next week. That's what we'll go into right. next and week. Let's identify, what about the manuscript evidence? Uh, you know, Jay, let's define to people for the benefit of their understanding, what do we mean by early manuscripts? Because I want <laughs> them to understand. Okay. What Hatun is really, uh, what Hatun has been working with, the Kidah, is nothing more than 8th and ninth century dottings and um, really, there, there are three different things that, that have been added in the 8th and 9th century, from the 8th and 9th century. At the beginning, in the 7th century, when the Quran was first begun, there was only what we have know as the skeletal text. Uh, if you can look here, I can't know if you can see, this is the skeletal text the, in black. See the, what's in black? That's the skeletal text. These are the 22 to 28 letters that are in the Arabic alphabet. But they're... There, there weren't 28 letters there at that time. There was uh, much, much fewer because many, look, just a little smiley face like this could be five different letters today, but not in the 7th century and not in the early 8th century. In order to delineate what that little smiley face was, that little cup shape, you need to have five different dots. One above it would be a na, two, one, two above it would be a ta, three above it would be a tha, one below it would be a ba, and two below it would be a ya, na, ta, tha, ba, ya. So five different letters could be delineated from just one little smiley face. But that those dots did not exist in the 7th century, did not exist in the early 8th century. They were added in the mid-8th century and then were canonized around the mid-8th century to the late 8th century. So at, at that time, then you had all of these different um recite our readers who then start putting dots all over the place to find many derivations many derivations look at that mug my goodness that fills up her whole face i know i know i, I tried to get a mug like this uh, big i couldn't find any anyhow hatun hatun i want hatun now that she's in full breath how many differences have we found have you just found already by looking at the different dots in the 37 that you have in your possession your team that is, how many different how many thousands how many tens of thousands of differences have you found just with those dots uh, yeah but let me just before that let me just show you something so this is one of the early sana manuscripts okay if people are able if people are able to see as uh yeah as you can see so one of the earliest manuscripts, this is mid 8th century, and it doesn't have the dots. Okay. The ones, the ones. Now, from uh, Hatun, I want to, I want to say something, uh, if you don't mind, yeah. because I don't want scholars to jump all over us uh, right here. It yeah. doesn't have dots originally, but some later on came into some of these manuscripts and yeah. added some dots, recognizing the difficulty in reading. So I just want to get this out there and at least somebody say, well, you guys are making false statements. I mean, I apologize. Yeah. I didn't mean to interrupt. Okay. So th the one I am holding is the Quran, which is identified as Sana Musaf, uh, attributed to the um, Ali, Caliph Ali. Uh, in his, uh, like, dots are not there uh, for the continentals. Um, but the 37 different Arabic Qurans I have, um, I haven't went through them all. The ones I went through is over 93,000. Now, um, repeat that again. Listen to that. 93,000 differences. Why have the Muslims not told us this before? Uh, Brother, they don't because, know. Okay, why is it Hatun's team has found this and no one else has found this? Do you see what I'm saying? Why because does it I'm take a generous Christian. Turkey, I love to have people. Turkey in four years has found something that for 1,400 years Muslims have never admitted. 
I, I say, let me rephrase that. Not 1,400 years, 1,000 years. Because these have been known for 1,000 years. These have been known since they were finalized by Ibn Mujahid in the 10th century, in 936. These seven Ahruf, that's the seven of the Ahruf, were finalized in 936. That's the 10th century. Yet now, we're now in the 21st century, and no one has mentioned this publicly. So can you see why you Qadi know, is having such a dilemma here? Because absolutely. And, and I want to say this, Jay, to say this. I want to say this, Jay. I mean, here's the interesting part about the early Islamic studies is that there are sources, Islamic primary sources by somebody like Adani or Ibn Abi Dawood. They wrote books called Masahif, Qurans, plural, not one. They reported readings that were known to them in those days, whether it's attributed to Ibn Masoud, Ubay, or Ali or uh, Ibn Abbas or Zayd ibn Thabit or others. But the problem with our Muslim friends, they don't study textual criticism of the Quran. It's a taboo thing. I never studied it. I never been exposed to it. I've always been told about the seven Ahruf, seven Ahruf. even the seven Ahruf or the seven Qiraat of Ibn Mujahid. He decided that based on a basically questionable Hadith tradition that reported the idea that there were uh, an incident that took place between Omar and someone, and then later on another, uh, uh, you know, we stop right there and just help people talk about what, what we're dealing with here. Look at the dates. This is something we have not done. We need to do this. Look at the dates of everything you're talking about. Ibn Mujahid is 936. That's 10th century. That's 300 years after supposedly this Quran was finally finalized. Where is he getting his material from? He's getting it from Al-Buhari in Sahih Muslim. Al-Buhari died in 870. So that is the late 9th century. We're talking about 240 years after Muhammad. You're finally getting this hadith that says that there are seven ahruf. The seven Ahruf was only introduced in the late 9th century, 240 years after the fact. So this is all coming from the 7th, I'm sorry, from the 8th, 9th century in the t uh, 10th century for that which supposedly was happening in the 7th century. And most, most everyone who's listening to us right now, I see there's about 460 people listening to us right now. Though, have you heard this before? Why haven't we been told this before? Now, that means everything that Muslims are dependent on, even this whole thing about Ahruf and Kiriyat, this idea of the 7 or the 10 or the 14, that comes from the 10th century, redacted back to the 7th century. So I'm even suspicious of that. Because I don't say, if that were the case, why don't we see this in the 7th century? Why don't we see any reference to these 7 or these 10 or these 14 in the 8th century? That why do we have to go exactly. to the late 9th century and then finally have it canonized in the 10th century by Ibn Mujahid in 936? Can you imagine us saying that about the Bible? I agree with you, Jay. And, and it seems to me, Jay, the theme that I'm noticing lately is that there were fluidity, some level of fluidity in transmitting the Quran early on. And I even would argue that the early Muslims were not this dogmatic as we see today. They were accepting of different readings. And then later, they began to realize it is creating problems. And if you want to really, you know, vouch for preservation or perfect preservation, you have no choice but to come up with a standard copy, assuming you're successful even in doing that project. But the reason I bring this up is that every Muslim thinks this all happened during the time of Muhammad, that this happened before Uthman. That these seven readings were there at the time of Uthman before uh, before Uthman, and that these readings all take, took place while Muhammad was bringing when Uman was brought to him, and he says, "Well, let me hear what you're saying," and then he says, "Well, that is acceptable. In fact, there are seven that are acceptable. How can that be if there's nothing written about this in that century?" The only time we even hear this introduced, this idea that Muhammad had a problem or that others had a problem, Muhammad had to uh, pretty much say, get take all seven of them. How is it that that only gets introduced in the late ninth century? Please, Muslims, for heaven's sakes, you can't expect us to believe something that's redacted back 240 years later. We're not going to accept that anymore. I want to see something in the seventh century. And you're going to hear me say this all the time. I want to see something in the seventh century that proves that either Muhammad or Uthman even said this. And we're going to get now to the elephant is in the room. But we're not, I'm going to wait on that because the elephant in the room has yet to be talked about yet in this live stream. But we'll Amen. come to that later. Thank you again for everyone who is with us. Thank you for the amazing moderators. Please, moderators, keep an eye on what's going on. There is a lot of comments and it will be hard for me to even uh, participate. And, and to those of you that are using, uh, you know, uh, let's say, um, uh, bad language against uh, hijab or others, we're not here to attack people. We're here to point out errors, and we want to pray for them, not attack them. That's the way we have to approach things. Um, Hatun, you mentioned 93,000, uh, you know, uh, let's call them 
variances or or differences how Sexual did you, variations. Uh, how, how did you find these you know was it you alone did you have a team working on it and what is the methodology in 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 a summary fashion, in a brief fashion, that uh, were used because I want people to know that it wasn't just you deciding this is different and this is different, and somehow you selected them yourself. Yeah. So um, I am Turkish, um, and I think my Turkish as good as my English, and I can recite certain things in Arabic, some Quranic verses, but I am not Arabic speaker. So the way I did is wait wait I wait 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 Hatun wait are you telling me there are Muslims that do not speak Arabic and understand what the Quran is saying? Yeah. Okay, just wanted to ask. Keep going. <laughs> miracle of Islam, miracle of Islam. Um, so what I have done was I took two copies of the Quran. One of them is Hafs, and then second Quran, and then I simply like went letter by letter to check if they look same or not. The ones they didn't look same, I underlined them and then I passed that to the Arabic speaker. Um, the Arabic speaker I was working, um, she's also Arabic teacher. And then I asked her, are those are the same? Are, uh, do they change the meaning or not? Uh, some of them I find, they were just like nothing, my mistakes. But some of them uh, we find out, um, they do change the meaning and we we'll check the dictionaries to see what is the dictionary definition of the word as well as what it is so all i did was just put my glasses on and then i went um word by word with compare the two qurans after i figured out with one quran i used that that quran with other with other um other qurans and then i check um i asked arabic speaker to check that so it was all visual and then after I identify the differences, Arabic speaker check that with the dictionaries, and then we end up having over 90,000. 90, and, and I know you did that because I was one of the Arabic speakers that also participated in checking that. So uh, let me ask you another question. You, were you using, I'm just generically speaking, the, the so-called the 1924 Cairo edition as the one to check against? Yes, I. Uh, in that time, the Quran I was using is uh, yes, I still have that Quran, um, Yusuf Ali translation of 1924 Quran, yes. And the reason Hashtag. I'm asking, uh, Jay, because Adnan Rashid is claiming that the 1924 Cairo Quran is a first century Quran. Please help the audience I... understand the history of the 1924 Cairo edition. Can we can we save this for another live stream? This is the by, by far the most explosive stuff. Uh, I don't want to really get caught up onto the manuscript. The manuscript evidence that Adnan Rashid just claimed yesterday is absolutely fallacious. We don't want to talk about but, the manuscript. I just want you to tell people, why do we call it 1924? Well, in 1924, there in Egypt, I'm sorry, in Cairo, just the city of Cairo, uh, they were finding that students were coming and having standardized tests uh, there in high school. And, oh my goodness, that mug. And every time they had these standardized tests, they were noticing that the, the on the Quran, they kept on coming up with different answers. And of course, the wrong problem was, is they were going to different Kirat. They were using different Kirat. This is nothing more than Kirat differences. So what they asked, they asked uh, one of the scholars, uh, Muhammad al uh, Husseini Al-Haddad, who is there at Al-Azhar University, to look and decide which of the Kirat, which of the readings, this is readings, should be the standard text that they should use for all their schools. And he said the Hafs which is a student uh, that died in 796. Uh, that's when he died. That's the late 8th century. And so his became the standard for just the schools in Cairo. And they took all the other Kira'at, the ones that, differ, that, that uh, differed with it, took them out into a boat and threw them into the Nile. Now, that didn't get rid of them because Hatun was able to find 37 of them uh, just in the last few years. Nonetheless, by 1936 then, because of what had happened in Cairo, that became so successful for standardized tests that the entire the government of Egypt decided to make the Hafs Gira'at reading the standard for all of Egypt. Now, there had been some changes between 1924 and 1936. We won't get into all that. There, there have been some changes as to what Hafs they were referring to because there are different Hafs. There's not just one Hafs. That became so successful in Egypt that in 1985, King Fahd, decided in Saudi Arabia, since that was so successful in Egypt, let's make this for the whole world. And so he put his stamp of approval in 1985, so we're talking about 25 years ago, 
to make this text, the Huff's text, standard for the whole world. And that's why we now go to the Huff's text for most of the, of the world. But there are so many other places that don't want to use the Huff's text, like in North Africa, where Hattun found, uh, when she went to the bazaar there, she found the wash, which is well known all over the northern part of, uh, of Africa. And that's why it's important that we realize that you can't just get rid of these different derivations of readings by dumping them into the Nile, nor can you get rid of them by burning them. Uh, you're going to find that we're going to still find them. And that's why we're starting to go public. And that's why when we went public in the 2016, it called a cause a crisis of faith for people like Muhammad Hijab, so much so that he had to ask finally this question to, uh, to Yasser Qadi just last week. But, you know, this is not even the worst thing that's going to come down the pike. That's something we're yet to talk about. And that's where Adnan Rashid should have kept his mouth shut yesterday. Bless his heart. He knew that Gandhi had made a mistake and Gandhi should have not said what he should have said. Because as he said, people don't understand this. This is something for the, oh, those of us who are much more scholared uh, talking about himself and others. But then he made a huge mistake by trying to rectify it. But that's for, that we can do for later on next week. So let's talk now about first Shabir Ali and um, not the talk about the Sana manuscript, which myself and Hatun will be dealing with. But in general, he was talking about the Quran and in uh, a number of his talks. And I think he did that during Ramadan. And you did address a number of those issues, uh, Jay. So um, let, let's talk about that. I mean, what is it that Shabir Ali was saying that you felt was, wow, it's it's out of this world. We've never heard it before from the mouth of a Muslim scholar. And now we're beginning to see admissions. Walk us through these things. I know, of course, about them. I want the people who are watching uh, to follow along with you. Yeah. I, I don't think that we have to spend too much time with Shabir Ali because he has he, this is, he's known for this. He's well known for this. This is nothing really new. It's what he didn't say that was fascinating to me. What he didn't say about what you find in Al-Buhari, Volume 6, 509 and 510. If you just read those two pages, which are really, the 509 is referring to 632 edition of the Quran under Abu Bakr. And the 510 uh, Hadith is referring to the 652 edition of the Quran under Uthman. So two different Qurans, two different caliphs, 20 years apart. And that's where you go to find out how the Quran was compiled. And what Shabir Ali was trying to say is, that these differences, these seven ahruf, all happened between 632 and 652. That these happened in places that were up north in the Shams and Iraq. These, he was blaming the, the uh, Syrians in the Iraqis for coming up with all these different recitations, which is true. These are recitations. And that's why Uthman had to bring Zaidi bin Thabit to get the original Quran that had been compiled in 632 after Muhammad died, had been given to Hafsa, one of the wives of Muhammad, who is the daughter of Umar, the second caliph, to take her Quran from 632 and to rewrite it a second time. Now, this time, when you read it, he wanted to rewrite it. So he wanted to rewrite it in the Qureshi dialect, and that's what Shabir Ali was pointing to, the Qureshi dialect. This is a dialectical difference, is what he was saying. This is a recited, recited difference. My, my difficulty with that is, okay, if it was recited, then why do you, what do you write down? What do you write down that's recited different than any other? In order to write down a recited text, you have to have Dhamma, the Kasara, the Fatah, you have to have the dots, you have to have what we now... Uh, what we know as, let me get the three different quotes. You have to have not only the Rus the Rusum is the same, is you have to have the Ijam, Ijam in the Harakat. That doesn't make sense in the 7th century. In the 9th century, and when Al Buhari is writing this, that would have made sense. But then here's the other problem, he said. Once they did get this, this recitation into one text, and they did, made that, then he burned all the other manuscripts. M hold a minute. If there are manuscripts you're burning, this has nothing to do with recitation. Do you see the problem? You're burning actually paper. You're burning a something that's written down on a piece of paper or a, uh, uh, an animal skin, mar parchment. That's what Shabir Ali didn't want to talk about. But he did also want to talk about the fact that even this whole story comes from 936. This comes from the 10th century, redacted back onto what was happening. And, uh, let me let me rephrase that. Not just 936. It all comes also comes from 870, from Al-Buhari. So you got to remember that everything Shabir Ali was talking about was what he believed, what he wanted to believe, that this is all that was happening in the time of Uthman, 652. And I'm saying, no, 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 come on. You got to, if you're rewriting a text, if you're putting it on paper, and then you're coming up with a completely new text that is even different from the one that was done in, in uh, 632, 20 years later, and then you have a new text, and then you burn all the ones that disagree, 
You are burning manuscripts. You are burning scripts. Not you're not burning someone's tongue who reads it, who recites it differently. And this is something that uh, Shabir Ali would not talk about. And that's one of the elephants in the room. That's just one of them that I like for him to talk about. And I would like to see if he would do a response to that. That I have not yet. I just thought that he put up a response uh, a few days ago, and it's an hour and thirty minutes long. Take a look at that response against me. That's just come out now. I just started looking at it, and I'm just sitting there shaking my head. And I said, he still doesn't get it. He still doesn't ask what we're at. I, I think you and I, I think for. definitely you and I, brother, need to respond to uh, parts of that, uh, in addition to your own response, of course. But uh, uh, to, to those of you, by the way, who are interested in the deeper topics about this, go to uh, CIRA International YouTube channel and also go to uh, Founder Films. And in there, you are going to find a two series that I did with uh, Dr. J. Uh, Smith about the Quran's many problems. That's one. And the other one is corrections to early Quran based on a book of one of my advisors, Dr. Uh, Dr. Daniel Allen Brubaker. And in there, we did talk about this tradition, the Bukhari uh, tradition about the Uthmanic collection, the recension and what happened to it and so on and so forth. And we show also different examples that Sister Hatun uh, worked hard on compiling these different examples. Now, here is what was interesting, by the way, about uh, Shabir's uh, talk. And I want to just add a few things from my own background. And then we're going to jump into Yasser Qadi and we want to invest the rest of the time on that. He stated that the Warsh text is slightly, and I want to emphasize, slightly different text based on a slightly different readings and mostly corresponds on what is being read in all over the world. I think he meant the Muslim world, probably. In other words, Shapir Ali is saying, really, truth, this is how, what I read, what I hear him saying, truth is relevant. Uh, you can read it however you want, but it's still the same, technically speaking. Now, I'm going to show a couple of examples of why there is a lot of holes in this. And me and Sister Hatun did a talk during Ramadan about fasting and some of the readings a problem in the readings of the Quran between Hafs and Warsh and here is the issue that we discovered basically one of them talks in chapter 2 verse 184 that if you cannot fast you need to feed poor people poor persons in a plural by the way Arabic is a Semitic language whenever it becomes a plural that means you're talking three or more and the other reading says you only need to feed one poor person. Now, Shabir Ali says it doesn't impact their doctrinal issues. I would argue that Shabir Ali doesn't either know what he's talking about or he is just intentionally trying to water down the damage. Islam is a religion of works. You earn good deeds. Feeding three or more is different than feeding one. With all due respect, Dr. Shabir Ali. So that's a, that's a doctrinal issue. Um, Jay addressed an issue which I thought it was brilliant uh, in his own response to Shabir Ali when he talked about, uh, actually, I'm going to talk about two. Chapter 1, verse 4 of the Quran, Surah Al-Fatiha, talks about Allah basically being the king over the day of recompense or the owner of the day of recompense, Malik or, uh, or Malik. What I would argue that there is a third also reading that no one wants to talk about, the reading of Abu Hanifa, the founder of the Hanafi school of Sharia, where he says, Malaka, meaning gained possession of the day of recompense. Wait a minute. If God gained possession, who did he take it from? Who was in charge of it in the first place? That's a doctrinal issue. I remember Ijaz Ahmed hitting the roof when I mentioned it in one of my Facebook, basically, comments. He just couldn't believe that there is something like this that I'm trying to propagate, he says. All that to say is that there are some serious issues. I want to close by one last comment and we'll jump into uh, Yasser Qadi after, of course, both of you can comment on this. Chapter 98, verse 6. 98, verse 6, where Shabir Ali really uh, did a spinning uh, over this issue and he accused Jay that he doesn't know Arabic. The word really has to do with the fact that describing Christians and Jews are being the vile or the worst of creatures. That's how Hafs reads it. Another read it, uh, reading, you can perceive it as saying that they are the worst of innocent. And yes, you can make a case also that it's the worst of those who were created, although the Arabic word used in there, al bariah is kind of weak to use for those who are created. Either way, even when you look at the um, gramma uh, grammarians, the Islamic grammarians, they struggled with this reading, al bariya the innocent, versus the other one. So for Shabir Ali, who doesn't, he, he's not a native Arab, 
I don't even know his knowledge of Arabic to come in and just act like it's a nonchalant, it's no big deal, is absolutely naive on his part because he is basically embarrassing himself when he keeps digging deeper and deeper holes because Dr. J. Smith does his homework. I work with him all the time and I enjoy how he does fact checking before he even goes out there to say anything. So with that says, I want to turn it over to you, Hatun. Any last comments about Shabir Ali before we jump into um, Yasser Qadi? Um, we, uh, we used to take the dictionary for Surah uh, 98 verse 6, the speaker's corner, because Muslims uh, wanted to play the game of denial versus creatures and innocent. Um, regarding Dr. Shabir Ali, um, my heart goes out to him, actually. Like it is, I think in Muslim circle, those things are big deal. You simply come and then tell people, for 1400 years, whatever we are, we were telling you behind the cameras, behind the mosques, that was all lie. But um, I think Jay remembers uh, when Shabir Ali had a debate with Jonathan McClatchy. In that debate, he already expressed he gave up the Quran of Muhammad, he gave up the Quran of Abu Bakr and Uthman, and his faith on Depend, 1924 Quran. And in his debate with Jay Smith, he expressed that. Uh, his faith on depend on the uh, miracle of number 19 for the uh, for the Quran. <coughs> that was uh, in but, 2014. Yeah, so within six years now, as the time goes on, they are aware that there are different Arabic Qurans circulated throughout Islamic history, and it is time for people to express that. And it's not only... Uh, just like uh, I think uh, the the new book came out. Hold on a minute. The book came out a couple of months ago, which is like a uh, Bridges the translation of the uh, Bridges translation of the Ten Qurat of the Noble Quran. This is simply giving you um over four thousand textual variations within the different Arabic Qurans, but the ones which change the meaning of the word. So now, uh, or maybe J. Smith failed in Arabic, maybe Shabir Ali failed in Arabic, maybe I failed in Arabic, but what Muslims did it, not fully honest, but they went one more step and they translated to English for people to have access. You've got footnotes after footnotes simply telling you yeah that word is different and it does change the meaning of the um of the sentence or of the word of allah yes so um jay uh, let's talk about uh, yasser qadi it was back i think in uh, june uh, 8th uh when uh, he was i believe in that interview that you were referring to with um uh, um, uh, what's his name, uh, Muhammad Hijab. So, and they brought up some serious issues and that's where uh, Yasser Qadi invested about 25 to 30 minutes struggling with these serious issues, but yet at the same time was honest enough to address those problems. And I know you did an analysis of that. So walk us through uh, that portion. Yeah. And you all need to watch it. Go look at it. it I mean, you can't go and hit Muhammad Hijab's fight anymore. It's not there. But go on Yasser Qadi's site. It is all there. Look and see what how we unpacked it. Uh, I unpacked it. Uh, uh, yes, um, Hatun, did you unpack it at all in your site? Um, um, we did put the video up, yeah. But did you, did you, did you analyze it or look at it? No, we, did, uh, we didn't look at it. We just uh, put the video up. Okay. David Wood and Tony Costa also did two hours on it. I haven't looked at it to see what they did, but look and see the what's happening. And what you're seeing here are two different worlds colliding. One is the academic world, which is uh, Yasser Qadi's world. And he is the by far the more honest. Give him kudos. And I think, you know, bless him that he is the one that actually is struggling with this. He knows it because he's grown up here. He's from Houston. He's from America. He went to he went to Yale, did his Ph.D. at Yale. And that's where he came across from what he's telling us, that's where he came across all these questions. These are simple questions. These are not the, these are, should not be, uh, he shouldn't have had to wait to go to Yale University and do a PhD to hear these questions. And he had a crisis of faith. So how did he deal with that crisis of faith? He explained it there in the video. 
He just went back on his mantra. The Quran is eternal. The Quran is the word of God. The Tawatiya, we, we understand it. We accept it. We don't have any question about it. And then he made a very interesting claim. He says, we in, and basically he was just saying what he did. We in Islam, we have such a respect for the Quran that we have a red line that we don't go beyond. We'd never go beyond that red line. Wow, what an admission. And that red line, the academic world has. The academic world doesn't have that red line. Now, see, we're part of that academic world. Hatu, you are. Certainly you are, Al-Fadi. I am. We're, I've got my doctorate. You're getting your doctorate. Hatu has spent, I don't know how many years working on this. We are the academic world that is now asking that. But it's not just us. They were asking that 25 years ago at Yale. What are you going to do with all these different derivations? What are you going to do with all these different Qurans? How can you say there's only one Quran? Now, his answer was, we don't ask that question. We don't ask that question. We don't go beyond that red line. The problem is, and he turned to, you can see his frustration with hijab. When hijab was saying, I want you to give an answer. I have a blank piece of paper here. What Quran are you going to write on that blank piece of paper? Is it going to be Hafs? Is it going to be Wash? Is it going to be Al-Duri? Al Which one of these is it going to be? And he didn't want to answer that. In fact, he he struggled. Al-Qadi struggled. And he said, "This I cannot answer that in just a 20-minute soundbite, but take my class. Just take my class and you'll get the answer. All the way through, he kept on saying, this is not something we can dis discuss in public. In fact, he was furious with the fact, if you look at the other hour and 20 minutes that happened before, Take a look and see. All the way through, there was this struggle he was having with hijab. Because many of these new converts that are coming out in London and Hatun has to deal with, these are the converts who are asking this question. It's not the old uh, the old guard. It's the new guard. It's the new converts that are saying, we live in the West. We have to answer this. We're hearing it from other people who are throwing it at us, mainly from Hatun and her team down at Speaker's Corner. How many times has Hatun been up on the ladder asking the same question from Mansur Ahmed, from Adnan Rashid, from Mohammed Hijab? And they won't answer this question. So that's why Muhammad Hijab has come to Yusuf, uh, Yasir Qadi last Monday. We're just talking about five days ago. And he wanted Yasir Qadi, who is considered to be one of the most respected clerics in the world today, to get to please give him an answer. And Qadi started shaming him and started castigating him and said, do not ask me this. I do want to ask this. Take my class and I'll explain to you. But don't ask me this in public. This is something I cannot ask, answer in public. Now, stop and think. Hold on a minute. This was a crisis for him 25 years ago. In Yale, 25 years later, he still doesn't have an answer. He could not answer Muhammad Hijab in that interview. And with all of us looking, he could not answer that. Now, to me, that is that is hugely revealing. And that is the problem with academic Muslims. Yasser Qadi is in a dilemma right here. Shabir Ali is in a dilemma right here. They dare not answer this because if they dare answer this, they're going to be hanged and quartered by all the millions. Listen, this is just, this is not just a few. Uh, uh, we're not just talking about a few academic uh, academics that live in America or live in Europe. We're talking about 1.8 million Muslims that disagree with Yasser Qadi. We're talking about the, all the Muslims that Muhammad Hijab uh, answers for. Muhammad Hijab has a huge following. I think he has about 227,000 followers, subscribers, just on his YouTube channel. Yasser Qadi has 336,000. These are huge followings. We have nothing of that size, that size in uh, Christianity, of those that's working in Islam. These, have, these are people who are hanging on to everything they say. These are people who are absolutely dependent for everything they say because their faith rests on what these scholars are saying. And when you have one scholar on one side who's an academic, who's actually saying, I have to answer to the academic milieu, I have to answer to this, and I don't want you to bring this up. And who are you to ask me this question? And how dare you, your, your converts, bring it up and actually put it in public and get me embarrassed? Because I don't have an answer. And remember, twice, twice, Muhammad Hijab had to put out his hand and said, I have a blank piece of paper. I want you to tell me, what are you going to write in there? Finally, look and see what his response was. At the end of the 25 minutes, what did he say? Did you see? Did you watch? Do you remember what he said? They are all the Quran. Every one of them is the Quran. You can see this is not what he wanted to say. He was forced to say that because what he has just done, he has gone, he has basically said what no other Muslim will dare say because Muslims don't can't say this academically. They can't say they're all the Quran because already Hatun has found 93,000 and just her team has found 93,000 differences between these 37. Well, actually, it's only 23 she's looked at. She hasn't even talked. She has another 13 to go. And there's going to be many more thousands, probably hundreds of thousands.
So can you see the difficulty that the academics have? And see that, remember what he said there, you don't realize that you in the East, and he's talking about the East versus the West. Isn't that interesting? He talked about the West over here and the East over here. You in the East, referring to Muhammad Hijab, you're still back in the East. You're the traditional, you're in the traditional school. The traditional school is still in its little ivory towers. I'm not ivory towers. You're still in your little cuckoo and you're only talking amongst yourself. You're not listening to what we're finding over here in the West. The West is not going to listen to that. Look at the example he said about the emperor with its clothes. What an example. I love that when he talked about the emperor in his clothes. Basically, the West is saying you have no clothes. And, and that's what I enjoyed about uh, him. The fact that he is admitting that the West caught up with this and now they're publishing papers. And what he, really Yasser Qadi did is what other is Muslim scholars who've been studying uh, early Quranic manuscript, but they didn't come publicly this way to talk about it the way Yasser Qadi did. And I'm hoping that more and more will do so. That's why we're thankful for people like you. Thankful for my professor, Dr. Uh, Daniel Brubaker, who was so courageous to take a, a different approach and at least bring into the forefront his findings without, of course, saying anything negative in any way, shape or form. Yeah. Very respectful, academic. And yet he received, if you remember, attacks from all directions. And now I wonder how people will feel now because others from within the Islamic community are acknowledging exactly what Dr. Brubaker have told them all along along with uh, you know you sister Atun, with UJ and we're thankful to be partners in journey here now I know we're, we're gonna come to a close pretty soon here I mean in the next maybe let's say 10 15 minutes give or take but uh, sister Atun, anything you want to add to this uh, in terms of yes or Qadi you know I know you and I will be dealing with uh, uh, what uh, Shabir Ali says about the Sana manuscript hopefully uh, we can cover at least some important grounds during the show which by the way uh, let people know uh, when is this going to take place today so that they are aware of it? And also where? It's not on your channel, it's on hers. That's right. At 9 o'clock uh, on DCCI YouTube channel. I hope you will be ready. <laughs> for that. 9 p.m. UK four, time, London four time. 4 o'clock yeah. Eastern time, United States. In, right. in two hours. Very good. Yeah, in two hours we will meet at DCCI live stream. Um, Yasir Kadi is one of the Muslim scholars I am actively following. The reason actually I come across with him was Muslim missionaries from Speaker's Corner. Uh, they pointed us to his book, uh, which kind of gives us the science of the Quran. Since then, I do actively follow him. Uh, but one of the things is I'm not surprised that much in the Islamic Muslim academic circle. Uh, they are where Yes, there are different Arabic Qurans. They are where there are the textual variations. Also, they are where with Surah 5, verse 101 and 102, that you cannot have doubt in your faith. There are the, the danger of that. Therefore, they have to reconcile with this is by simply pulling back and not asking simple questions. When uh, I think the phrase Jay used was when... Uh, red line comes uh, when Yasir Kadri was pushed for the red line is um, because Muslims all around the world are now aware of the Sheikh Google. They are all aware of the Sheikh YouTube. So people simply go to YouTube in Malaysia where the, you've got like uh, areas where you live under the Sharia. People simply go to YouTube and then they come across with the arguments Christians are bringing them. So they are saying, okay, those Muslims whom they follow are not able to give them answer. But they need answer because now they start like, they meet with something called critical thinking. They're introduced to think critically, even though they know they should not. Mm. And then once they start saying, oh yeah, my mother, my father, my imam, my sheikh, tells me there is only one perfect Quran. This bunch of Christians who turns out out of the blue or pink, they tell me, actually, you've got different Arabic Qurans. And then it takes years, <clears throat> it takes years for Muslims to become public about it. And now what's going to happen is, as we saw on the video, that Muslim missionaries simply pushing a sheikh um, 
I'm sure Al-Fadi, you know this better than me. We do grow up in the idea that you always respect someone who, who is in the higher authority when it comes to the education or when it comes to of the course. level. The Quran so, says, do not ask. Yeah, so you, you can't take your shake on to say like, okay, now you have to say, doesn't matter there are different Arabic Quran, still we will know what Muhammad intent. Muslim missionaries simply pushed a shake to make that public statement. Yet, um, bless him, he tried to hold for a while, but towards and he was just like, yeah, we would come with um, with some, but it wouldn't be only one version or 10 different versions. Um, so in that sense, it is good, but uh, for me, it is all good because when those videos goes out, when people meet more Shake YouTube or Shake Google, they will get to know that they have been lied for 1,400 years or 1,300 years. They have been lied. And of course, the consequences of this is I cannot trust Muslims. I cannot trust Islam. I need to give up that ideology. That's the part I am interested in. And I would love to seriously say a huge thank you to uh, Sheikh Yasser Qadir to uh, helping me out in that. And also Muslim missionaries for bringing that out. It's good for the kingdom. Amen. Now, let me turn uh, to both of you uh, in this final, um, you know, uh, in this final segment. Uh, so, Jay, what are you planning on doing in the weeks to come? And I want people to be aware of this so they can come and follow the work you're doing, brother. Yeah, I, as you well know, uh, maybe you don't know this, for those who are, who are new, I'm actually, if you look on Fander Films, I have been for the, since January, for the last six months, almost seven months now, have been looking at the 7th century. I want to look at the 7th century and find what exactly is there. What do we know? Uh, and I've been asking, looking for five things. I'm looking for Muhammad in the 7th century. I'm looking for Islam in the 7th century. I'm looking for Muslims in the 7th century. I'm looking for the city of Mecca in the 7th century. And I'm looking for the Quran in the 7th century. So these are the five things I've been looking for. And I'm using lots of help from Mel, uh, from Sneakers Corner. I'm using Murad uh, from the Middle East. These guys have been real, real help for me to actually do a lot of the... Plus, I have two other people that I'm not permitted to name who are also doing research for me. But what's fascinating is, in every case, we cannot find one reference so far of any man, book, name, place, or city, and certainly not the Quran, in the seventh century prior to 690. So when I say seventh century, I mean prior to 690. In fact, we're finding just the opposite. But it's the Quran that is probably the most exciting because I wasn't planning to get to the Quran yet. I was going to do that probably in July and August where we're going to start going to the and really confronting the Quran. We've had to do that because of these two pronouncements, these two videos that were put up from May 19th and then uh, in June 8th. It just came out. It's like a gift. I mean... God bless Sabirai for being honest. Thank God for Yasser Qadi for being honest and actually making this, uh, making these admissions. Albeit, it's gonna they're gonna be in a huge hot seat. And he even puts it on his. If you could put it, look on his site, it's called hot seat. He's been put on the hot seat and forced to answer these questions. Now, because of that, I'm trying to reverse and really go to the other direction. And that's where uh, you and I are. What we're going to be doing is we're going to start looking and unpacking the Quran. It's a little bit earlier than I wanted to. We're going to start confronting the manuscript. But I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the Kid'at. That's, I'm leaving to Hatun and others who are much more experienced on the Kid'at. I'm going to the Razm. I want to really confront the 7th century. I'm not interested in the 8th and 9th century. I can't, I'm putting away because everything of this discussion, this whole discussion has geared towards what people are saying in the 9th and 10th century. I want to see what they're saying in the 7th century. I want to see what Quran was there. I want to see if the Muslims can produce one Quran, one manuscript, that is 114 surahs. And I'm just listen to all the Muslims who are listening. One Quran that is 114 surahs at the time of Uthman. That's 652. That is exactly like this Quran that I have here, this little Quran that I have that here, that is exactly the Arabic, not the English, the Arabic, that is exactly like this. And I'm not asking for kid up now. I'm not asking for any 
dire critical march. I'm not asking for any dots on it or any dagar aleph. I'm not asking for any vowelization. The dama, the kasarapata. I don't care about that. I want to see a skeletal text of one Quran, one manuscript that has 114 surahs that can be dated to 652 because that's what I'm interested in. And I hear Muslims saying that they can trace it back textual history. Remember, Hatun, we were on the ladder even just a year ago, and Mansur Ahmed made that claim from the ladder. I, we can trace the Quran all the way back to 652. Adnan made that claim last night on your on your on your channel. He says, yes, we have the entire Quran by 719, by the first century age. I would love to see even by 719. I want to see one Quran. So I'm now even giving them uh, I want to see from 652 because they claim that. But they're now going saying yes, they can produce one Quran called complete Quran by 719. I'm that's the eighth century. Muhammad died in 632. We're almost coming up to almost 80 years later. They still cannot produce one Quran, full Quran. But I'd like to see if they can, because they make that claim. So that's where I'm heading. There, we're going to be start looking, and we're going to be looking at the Husseini manuscript this week. We're going to be looking at the top copy. We're going to look at the Samarkand, we're going, uh, which is in Tashkent. We're going to be looking at the Ma'il manuscript. We're going to be looking at the Sana manuscript, and we're looking at the Petropolitan manuscript. We're going to look at the St. Petersburg manuscript. We're going to be looking at every manuscript that Muslims claim are Uthmanic. And we're going to unpack and show you what we are now finding. And you have yet to find out. Al-Fadi knows what I'm talking about. Hatun does it yet. But we have now looked at all the 63 fragments that they have up on Islamic Awareness website. And we have studied every one of those 63 fragments. We're going to show you what we've that. now found with those fragments. And then we're going to do something even better. Now this is a project we're still working on. We're going to look at all the major manuscripts. And we're looking at only the razm between the major manuscripts. We're looking at only the razm. That means the skeletal text. And we're going to do comparisons like what Hutton did. We just want to look at the rhythm of all these major manuscripts and see if they agree from the 8th century, from the 9th century, with the rhythm that we have in the Huff's text. Ooh, doo -doo. So we have a lot to do. Exciting stuff oh. coming ahead. But that's where I'm going to be working with because it's, this, is the, you know, this is something that should have been done 1,400 years ago. Oh, even 1,000 years ago. Why is it that we, who are not even Muslims, why are we doing this? Why is it we have to do this kind of work on their manuscript since they're making the claims we don't make these claims now remember their claims are not just that their claims are that this book is eternal this book sits in heaven has always existed which kiraat is there in heaven which one of these 37 that hatun has found is in heaven is it the hubs is it the el duri is it the Khaloon? is it is it the Warsh? which one is it they're not going to answer that one because there, there were no dots in heaven <laughs> in fact those are all man-made that's all man-made man creation from the ninth into eighth and ninth century but i'm going to ask something much more difficult and that is where is there if they're making the claim that it is eternal if they're making a claim that it was complete between 610 and 632 when muhammad died and was finally written in 632 i want them to prove it that's all i'm going to say prove it Show me your Quran that you're referring to. Show me this Uthmanic text. When we know that Alti Kulich has said categorically, there is no Uthmanic text, and he's their scholar. So I want them to show me, since they believe they know more than, uh, than Alta Kulich and Ekmel and Nisaladu, the two scholars who came out in 2007 and said we cannot find it in Uthmanic, then I want to see why is it they can find it. So we're going to sit back and we're going to let them prove it. This is going to be fun. Go with us. We have an awful lot of work to do. Sit back because we're going to do the research. We're going to put up the, I'm not, we're going to do the research. The, the research has been done by others much more capable than you and me. But we're going to be doing the, the actually communicating it because a lot of people are sending us material that they want us to communicate. We'll do that for them. So that's where we're going to go probably the next month, two, three months. Amen. Oh, two, 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 two. Everybody is like commenting on this iconic phrase. Hatun. Uh, what will you be working on? We know that you and I will be talking about, uh, uh, you know, Shabir Ali's talk about Sana manuscript, but any other work related to uh, the different Qurans and uh, Qiraat and, and so on and so forth? Yeah, uh, so tomorrow is Sunday, day of Speaker's Corner. Uh, we'll be at Speaker's Corner and hoping that uh, some of the Muslims who made the claims will turn up to Speaker's Corner so we can have proper discussion with them. And... Um, I'm gonna go through Adnan Rashid's video because I was someone sent the video to me to simply say um, I got destroyed by the stupid claims I make. So I spent two hours. That was very very painful two hours to watch that video. I watched the video and I will be putting some rebuttals um, to that video. Actually, I'm not gonna put any rebuttals. All I'm gonna do is just read the Islamic sources and let Islamic sources to um, exp um, expose Muslim missionaries. And I am confident that Lord Jesus Christ is going to use that for his kingdom. Of course, on the other side, we are 
uh, that that is locked down still in England. We are training people to do online uh, discipleship for ex-Muslims who live in different part of the world. So that's gonna take like my big chunk of nights um, to making sure I'm working with these um, right Christians on how to equip ex-Muslims. And that will be like whole week. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much to both of you for taking time in, in such a short notice to come on board and to unpack. Can I just point out something very... real quickly? Absolutely, absolutely, brother. I and I want to, by the way, I thank everybody Islamic... who joined us here. Go ahead, brother. Islamic Critique has just given $20 for Hutton to get a bigger mug. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I, don't, I don't need a bigger mug. Well, it, you, you know, everybody's face. asking about your mug, you know, Hatun. So you may want to have a section to sell some of these mugs. You'll make a lot of money doing that. I'm going to uh, do those for this one. So this is Aisha. Uh, okay. But I decided, like, like none of us going to stay in this world so long. So I'm going to pass them to David Wood once I die. So I've got, like, wives of Muhammad on this side. And then this mug is... Good helps me to practice my art, so I draw Mohammed on it. Sometimes, like he's got broken tooth, sometimes he's got sheep next to it. Uh, but Mark reminds me, Lord Jesus Christ is the living water. Whatever we we are uh, need in this world, our hearts should be desired for Him. So guard your heart above all things, for our risen Lord. Amen. Amen. Again, thank you for both of you for uh, making time for such an important topic. Thank you for the hard labor that you do. Thank you for uh, allowing me the privilege to serve him alongside of you. Pretty soon, you and I, Hatun, will meet again, and we will unpack yet another um, at least powerful, powerful admission. Let's let's face it. I am thankful at least for both of these men, Shabir Ali and Yasser Qadi, for coming forward and risking their life, I have to say. I mean, this it takes a lot of courage to say something like this in a Muslim world that is not going to be accepting, at least not at this level yet. Hopefully, they're pioneering uh, something new here uh, within, from within the Islamic community. I'm thankful for uh, the privilege that the Lord has given us, given you, given uh, all of us to at least come forward with these issues and force the topic to be finally dealt with. Thank you for all of you who've been joining us. Thank you for all of you who gave um, uh, through the super chat. I appreciate your sacrifices and your prayers for us. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, of course. And another thing, uh, tomorrow I will have David Wood, uh, a, a somebody that uh, not many of you know. And then next week I'm going to have Sam Shimon. I'm going to have uh, Alex Blagajevich. I'm going to have Islam critiqued, uh, gave me the honor uh, to be with me uh, on my live screen, uh, stream. We're going to have a testimony from an ex-Muslim from Somalia also next week. And then we will have uh, Brother Osama Duktuk as well. So we have a quite a line of waiting here for us. And hopefully soon we will have more and more of these panel discussions by way of doing this live stream. Thank you to both of you. Lord Thank bless you. you. And uh, this is Al-Fadi over and out. Thank you.